All right, Mike, you're all set. Okay, good morning. Welcome. I would like to call our meeting to order. It is um, 9 a.m. Stephanie, would you please take attendance? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, Ava Buman and Zimmerman has not yet joined us. Helen McKinnerick? Present. Uh, Alice Pritchard? Present. And Mike Soltis? Present. And Holly Williams? Present. All right, we have a quorum. All right, thank you, Stephanie. I would like to welcome uh, and thank the members of the public for joining us this morning. First agenda item, um, I'd like to ask the committee for a review of the January 4, 2024 minutes and a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve. And second. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Um, moving to the next agenda item discussion on the CEO performance review process. And uh, as we discussed last uh, meeting, we want to keep this on the agenda every month so that we uh, continue to make progress and to completion. Uh, the update is... Um, We've started with a review of the competencies. You may recall those documents um, from Fran's agency that we sent to everyone. And Aaron uh, reviewed the competencies, uh, made some edits to make them more appropriate for um, this, uh, an executive role. Uh, I've weighed in on uh, Aaron's comments and we should be in a position soon to send that draft to you. Uh, and I'll let Aaron comment on that in a second. And once we finish that, um, at least from my perspective, we have two other steps. One is to prepare a timeline. And the second is to prepare a process for receiving input from board members and uh, some of Aaron's staff. So if any of you have any comments or thoughts on um, the timeline or a process for receiving comments, you could either voice them now or send them uh, to Aaron. Uh, but Aaron, I'll turn it to you to see uh, if you have any comments on where we are and where we're going. Sure, so let me go. Oh. Stephanie, can you make me a co-host? So I do have a couple of things to share on my screen. There we go. First, we did try to um, get to the slide. There we go. Oops, wrong slide. Try to shrink on the competencies in the draft form. Um, kind of so these are the seven we kind of came up with. And I will share the actual document again. Stop sharing that and share this new document. So the first thing um, I think we had aligned on earlier was to do a one through four instead of a one through five, just because, um, you know, there's really no measurable difference um, when he exceeds expectations. <laughs> uh, and these are basically consistent with government. Um, and then we did into the draft, in addition to the areas of strengths and opportunities for development, just some reference to goals, because part of the proposed process would be for the CEO to identify goals that they're supposed to achieve, you know, to make sure that those are accounted for. But getting back to the competencies, there were um, a lot of competencies in the original draft, and there was a lot of words per competency, and that actually creates, I think, more confusion. So we suggest you know, shrinking it down to um, the seven that I, I alluded to. You're focusing on technical expertise, 
um, so the CEO should have and use the skills, knowledge, and experience to deliver results. Um, they should be skilled at problem solving and decision making um, to meet and plan for obstacles and issues, demonstrate good judgment, um, kind of. And I think that encompasses a lot of the planning and organization competencies. You should, planning and organization, I think, are necessary elements of participating and planning for obstacles and resolving them. Um, I want to make sure we talk about the customer focus, um, but again, trying to use fewer words <laughs> um, just to make it a little bit easier. So still being responsive, service anticipated, inspiring confidence, um, anticipating the needs for others, being responsive and managing expectations. Um, so you can't always make sure that you achieve everything, but it is absolutely within the leader's responsibility to make sure that they're communicating and managing expectations. But we put expectations under the customer focus and then communication, which once you already have dealt with all of that, it seems to address the interpersonal skills and kind of values. And so we jump down to role model. Um, and that's really the part where we're talking about how are you representing the authority, um, which is kind of a standard expectation, I think, for a leadership role. And then focusing on leadership skills, making sure the team is developed, making sure that you're thinking about the future. And then the value creation is sort of the area where we talk about kind of impact outside of the agency, kind of into the broader population. So it's a quick summary. And we, you've seen these before, but maybe not with all these edits. We just wanted to kind of summarize them and I can share them after to see if anyone else has any edits. But just wanted to check to see if you are aligned with the idea of having fewer competencies and, and fewer words per competency. Alice is nodding. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of that step of it. And then if there's no discussions about the competencies, then we are going to Share my screen again, go back to the deck, and we can talk about um, the time frame. This is the time frame I had shared in December. Just want to see if everyone makes sense, think, thinks it makes sense. The idea would be set your goals in the beginning, have a mid year meetup um, by November, kind of have the CEO kind of share what they have accomplished during the year. And then goal would be to have the evaluation in December. Um, obviously these dates are kind of targets, um, but I think I think it's useful to have dates because once you put things on the calendar, it's much more likely to get done. Any thoughts? Did you want, to, oh, sorry, Alice. No, go ahead, Holly, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, did you want comments now on the question for discussion? Um, that would be great, yeah, because I don't know where that really should fit in. Um, so I, I'm of the mind that, you know, an end of the year evaluation shouldn't be a time to lay on, like, um, a bunch of substantive feedback. I think it's more productive if it's kind of given in real time so there's appropriate context. So I think that prior to the July mid-year check-in, um, if board members have something material that they want to be um, conveyed that they should be asked to do it at that time and then also in advance of the final evaluation. I don't think the final evaluation should be a shock to the individual being evaluated. Um, that's my professional opinion on that. Thank you. And Alice? 
I, I, I might ho follow Holly now and just say that the same thing could be true for staff um, or you definitely want to, I think, do the, the staff solicitation between the November 1st and December 15th uh, dates. But I could be convinced that there's a could be an opportunity at the, before July as well. So again, it's not all just at the end. Mike or Ellen? Well, I think that's, I agree with Holly. I think that's a good point to uh, <clears throat> uh, use that midpoint. Uh, if there's anything to be raised, uh, why wait until the end of the year? So I think that's, uh, I like that. I, I just have a question about why goals are set by January 31 as opposed to earlier. Um. It absolutely could be earlier. That was just, mm. it, part of it was sort of the recognition of December gets really busy. <laughs> and yeah. So do you want, I mean, it could be January 15th. I think, you well, know, just it, trying to get a meeting in, yeah. in that first week of January is, is a little tricky or the last week of December. So I assume these goals are going to be presented to the board, right? Yeah. So really, we're talking either the January board meeting, or or if that's too early, then we're stuck with January thirty first, which will be discussed at the February board meeting, right? As you're saying that, I was thinking back to sort of what we've been doing is using that January board meeting as the where have we been, where we've we going, and that sort of. Mm. At least these last two years been sort of the opportunity to say these are what I think the agency and their personal goals are. So we could say that um you know I'm trying to think the second Thursday of the month, the earliest that could be would be January eighth. So we could say um you know, by January 5th, CEO and meets with the evaluation team to set the goals so that they're ready to be shared with the board at the first board meeting. Mm -hmm. Alice? Erin, <clears throat> would you want to think about doing it as part of the November 1st packet? You know, like as you're thinking about the year that you've just finished laying out goals for yourself in the year ahead, and so it becomes part of the part of that process. I mean, I hear you about December, but I'm wondering if it could be part of November 1. Mm. Um. I think that makes sense also to okay. kind of, because that November 1st um, deadline is kind of the opportunity for reflection. So, you know, it's the um, piece in the process where we kind of do a little bit of that pre-work of like where you are, like are today versus where you're going. So mm -hmm. um, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I also would agree with the rest of the group on the um, staff board member feedback earlier in the year. Um, I'm very much of the opinion with uh, performance evaluations that there be, if there's an issue that there be meaningful opportunity to improve <laughs> um, and time to do so. Mm -hmm. So I think the earlier that kind of feedback is solicited and to Holly's point, kind of on an ongoing basis, even um, more informally, um, that is helpful. <clears throat> um. And I'm going to put it down for both. I can spell before July 15th and between November 1st and December 15th. So, what we could do would be the January board meeting. CEO um, reports on annual goals. Number two. Reports is the wrong verb. 
some something that sounds less sinister than discloses, but shares. <laughs> There's annual goals. Pre presents, yeah, whatever. Shares, shares is good. Yeah. And we kind of, so the next topic would be the feedback, but we would solicit the feedback, have that mid-year review, have that November. Um, does anyone want the June, July? meeting to be sooner if you want that to be july 1st instead of the 5th 15th now that we've pushed the goals back we have more time at the beginning of the year that makes sense aaron and i think you're going to set them at the december meeting not november right but um you're handing them off in November, and then there's a discussion <clears throat> in December where I would think the goals would also be discussed for the upcoming year. So I'm thinking yeah. of an example where you might say, you know, this was a goal last year. It's not going to be, a, we didn't accomplish it, and it's still not going to be a goal for the year ahead. And yeah. That conversation would happen in the December evaluation process, I would think. Set. Okay. I'm going to... I think you're right. So we, we might talk about them in November, but really establish them as part of the evaluation. Um, okay, so, by, so that kind of the first half of the year we do a check-in, we do feedback before. For that first meeting, where my screen is and where you all are, I can't actually see, so I'll fix the job first afterwards. Um, then again, we can do feedback sort of in that November timeframe between November 1st and December 15th. Um, does that work as a any other checkpoints that you think should be put into play? So then the question is sort of how we do the board yeah. and staff feedback. I've been trying to uh, research 360 reviews and processes, and they're all over the map. I, I personally haven't had experience with them. I don't know if anyone has had experience doing them and has a feel for how they should be done. Um, my my general sense um and sort of not with a 360 feedback but with with dealing with performance evaluations when you have multiple people um who have input is that it should be private that should there should be the opportunity for sort of a discussion um between the person who's giving feedback and the evaluation team. So the chair and the, I think we've established the evaluation teams, the board chair and the chair of the policy and personnel committee, as opposed to it being kind of a free for all. But beyond that, I don't, I don't know what, what you all think would be the best approach. Well, when you say staff feedback, Aaron, you're talking Direct reports, or are you talking all staff? So that, that's actually a great question for, for you. I think there's at least the senior staff, so maybe my, my directors. Again, I've, I've seen the, the, the idea of 360 reviews, um, at least when you research it, is, is all over the map in terms of whether it should be everybody, whether it should just be senior staff whether you want to make it mandatory for senior staff, but voluntary for anybody else. I, I think it's, um, my sense it's probably at least the senior staff. I don't know if anyone yeah. wants it open to anyone else, but I also don't want to direct the process too much because it's something that's first getting paid. <laughs> I 
be does. my inclination is to limit it to senior staff, at least for starters, but um, only because it seems a little unwieldy to me to have feedback from 40 people. Oh. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any expertise in this area, so <laughs> I'm, I'm all ears here. Aaron, can I just offer that I, you know, I think 360 is is good, but is not the standard practice that we would do. Like, you know, I think occasionally you would, you know, at, at some milestone or something like that. Either you could do it to start because you haven't had one, and we could do a full 360. But I think what we're trying to outline is the regular course of business. So mm -hmm. I think it would be uh, uh, scaled back a bit, um, and I think it could be either that you know that the the ways I have seen it is that the we would have you know an executive session with the board where there was an opportunity to provide feedback to the chairs of the evaluation committee, but nobody was having to fill anything out. But then those those two would provide you with a written summary of comments so that you had had that. Um, so when you're doing so that that's been my experience is an is an is a executive session discussion. And then a summary of useful comments. Um, and then usually my experience with staff was that it was a it was a phone interview with a committee member, but I <clears throat> I think you could you could do a survey as, as well if that was easier for folks. But I, Ellen and Holly may have thoughts on that as well. Hmm. I I mean I think in practice, your, you know, the supervisors and directors of the various divisions as part of their practices should be having conversations and evaluations with their staff. And part mm -hmm. of that conversation should be, um, you know, those open-ended questions that allow the staff person to comment on the organization as a whole, its culture, and any issues. And through that process, the, you know, unit director or section director or, you know, division head should be able to consolidate those comments, look for themes, and ferret out those items that, um, should be kind of formalized and 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 be part of their feedback to you on what's happening with you in the broader organization but then also kind of be able to ferret out those items that maybe the staff person needs some coaching on or can simply be ameliorated through something else maybe better communication or a, a training aid or or something like that and i think that that is an important role for um, that middle level to take um, because otherwise I agree with Mike. I think it's it's unwieldy and I think um, I mean I'm I'm definitely a fan for open feedback, but I think you just I think you just need to be mindful of you know what type of mm. business practices you're building in and kind of what culture that breeds and whether or not it really leads to a productive end. Um, so, um, I mean, I mean, those would be my comments. Um, I mean, and I know that you have staff meetings and stuff like that. So those are also times where people should be encouraged to bring up mm. issues that they're having with the broader organization. Um, cause I just think, I think that's a better way to operate. Um, but yeah, so I don't, I don't know that I would do like a wholesale, you know, how do you think I'm doing today? Um, but I agree with Alex. So, I mean, I agree with Alex. Um, we have had people do the 365. It's it's intense. Um, I don't think it's bad to have in the rotation, particularly if if the culture of the organization seems to be something that um, uh needs to be reframed a little bit or there's a morale issue or there's been significant change in the organization and you need to get kind of the pulse on what's going on. But um, I don't know that it needs to be part of your annual process. Um, I think feedback might start to kind of dwindle over time if you do it all the time. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. 
um, I think with the 360, because it is so involved, um, most, at least in my experience, organizations choose to do that kind of to Holly and Alice's point at like milestones or times of significant change. And I think the, um, it, it's a little bit of a balancing act because the more feedback you request of people, the less they want to offer it or the less detailed or the less thoughtful they are about it because they're like, oh, another survey. I'm going to click through, you know, these these options and I'm not going to provide my written comments because I feel like I'm doing it all the time. So um, I think it's important to be mindful of soliciting um, feedback in a manner that elicits the actual quality of information that you're mm -hmm. hoping to get. Um, and there are other opportunities that you're giving, you know, the staff as a whole to provide that feedback. And I do agree with Holly. I think it's important that the senior staff as part of their role are creating, um, you don't just want the open channel of communication to be from everybody to you, mm -hmm. but, you know, creating those open ch um, channels of communication between themselves as the leader of that particular business area. Um you know, and providing that in a more consolidated way as part of a regular process that we're using every year, um, I think is important. So thank you, for everyone. So what I'm hearing is sort of board member feedback solicited in an executive session. Mm -hmm. So sort of by its very nature verbal. In June, <laughs> we're going to do it in May or June, depending on the time frame. Um, before June or July 1st. Is that, as board members, it's really about, do you think what folks would feel most comfortable doing instead of having to put stuff in writing? And it's sort of the easiest approach, I think. It's the least intensive from a work perspective. Was um, it also before July 1st and before the end of the year? Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, December okay. meeting or... Yeah. <sighs> I'm going back to that timeline, my thought would be um so just going back there a second you know that that self-evaluation in writing can be easily shared right so um so then then that can be what's shared with the board in terms in in potentially prompts the um the executive session, but based on the time frame, what to do before the November December board meeting? Well, it actually could work. It could either be done in the November board meeting or the December board meeting mm -hmm. executive session. Um, as long as EO gets their, their work together before November first. All right. Yeah. Um, and no later than December meeting. You know. Yeah. Okay. And then for the senior staff. How many uh, senior staff are there? So, um, you know, anonymous surveys are available. We can set that up and have them go directly to, to the evaluation team. Um, that may be less time consuming than for the evaluation team to talk to each of the members. Um, that's why I ask how many there are, because like, <clears throat> Alice's suggestion 
with a phone call. Uh, I don't know what the staff would be more comfortable with, something to fill out or a phone call. Um, my gut tells me they might be more candid in a phone call. Um, but I'm wondering how many there are just to measure the uh, effort involved. Yeah, so Lori, Dave, Michael, John, Jess, Maddie. Six. Six. And and I don't see us adding a new division. <laughs> so yeah, I think yeah. six feels like it's about <clears throat> the right number. I don't know. I mean, we have a committee with five uh, sub five members. I don't think that's that much effort if that's the preferred approach, a call rather than a survey. Absolutely. I mean, so with the exception of Lori, who really doesn't have a, a committee of cognizance, um, you know, I think you know, um, Maddie and Jess present all the time to outreach and engagement. David obviously is always at finance. John mm -hmm. um, is often at finance, is often at um, the board meeting. So, um, you know, there's definitely an opportunity for staff to say they would like to share with a, a board member with whom they feel comfortable. Um, you know, so we could say, could establish it that way. Um, you know, but it, it really is, it's sort of that balancing of what's the, a reasonable incursion of our board members' time mm -hmm. versus um, sort of getting the feedback. Well, what do you, go ahead, Holly. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Honestly, I can't find the little hand raised thing. Um, so I apologize if I'm just butting in. Um, I think that that having board members have um, a discussion during executive session is is more than sufficient. Um, I think if that discussion let's just say for argument's sake, that discussion were to take us down a road where we thought there needed to be more substantive conversation, then we could decide to go into executive session again or provide some, or to go to like, you know, one-off phone calls if we needed to, because that wouldn't be, that wouldn't constitute a convening. Um, so I think that this is just like, the preferred framework for us to follow, but there is nothing binding us to this. If once we get in it, we find that we need to mm -hmm. kind of take a tangent, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, th I mean, I think for the purposes of having something outlined that everybody that keeps us kind of on pace for um, checking off the tasks that are necessary um, in our capacity, then I think meeting in a meeting is is more than sufficient. Instead of having a formal process to solicit the feed, the staff feedback? Well, I mean, at least from the from the board, I think I think the board feedback, we can bring it to a meeting and, you know, one of us can, you know, volunteer to type it up or however we want to, to consolidate that information. I think staff feedback could simply be solicited, you know, through email or something. I know that I will say that we do it. We solicit it in writing. We consolidate it all up and then we have a follow-up meeting. I know that's what we do, um, which is productive. Um, so that might be a good way to do, you know, staff feedback. Yeah. And, and just for clarity, like, I, I don't know if we shared this. I have one-on-ones with everybody on my senior staff. We have bi-weekly full team meetings and everybody, each of the departments has their own staff meetings. So it's not like nobody talks to each other. <laughs> we talk a lot during the during the course of our lives. Um, but yeah, I just wanna make sure that if the board feels it's helpful to have a standardized pro process for soliciting staff feedback, we have it for you. 
if you think it's more useful to get on an ad hoc basis, that's, there's absolutely nothing that would prevent that from happening. I just want to make sure the board has what they, they feel they need. That's really the goal. Well, I'm curious, Holly, when you <clears throat> solicit feedback, um, I assume you send an email, uh, mm -hmm. is there a, a format? I mean, you know, if you have, there's a very broad, if you have any feedback, let me know, or something more targeted, um, you know, what are, what are the things you like? What do you think you wish would change? I mean, is how structured is that request? Yeah, so that's a fair question. So there's um, a rubric. I mean, like a simple rubric that has, I think, five or six categories, which if we kind of go back to how Erin started her presentation, like the core competencies, mm -hmm. um, you know, they center around like communication and, you know, leadership qualities mm -hmm. and then um, expertise in the subject matter. And then there's a section at the bottom that allows for kind of open-ended commentary. Mm -hmm. It's it's extremely high level. And I think that's important because it helps to focus the conversation that happens after that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I think that for our purposes for the senior staff, something that's just a couple like three or four thoughtful questions that um, tie into things that we think are important um, in the executive director position and kind of tie back to those competencies that Aaron um, is going to mm -hmm. be evaluated or whoever the executive director is going to be evaluated on. I think that that'll solicit enough information for us to kind of see if there's any themes or anything that we would want to be aware of. And some people will be probably extremely detailed and then other people will likely not say that much, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. no, I think that approach sounds sounds good to me. Um, I am curious, are these documents, these are personnel documents excluded from disclosure? Well, um, so your personal file is you have to assume that anything in a personal file is subject to FOIA, although there are obviously things that are in personal files that one would redact, like beneficiary information, bank account information, medical information, which should be in a separate file. Um, performance evaluation of a... So... It is possible for a board to go into executive session to discuss the performance evaluation of staff. Documents that are used in the context of that performance evaluation would be covered under the sort of, we're not going to produce it because it's a document used in executive session. I just don't know if feedback solicited prior to a board meeting I think there'd be an argument that that's still covered under that exemption. It's just a little bit more attenuated. We can mm -hmm. do some more research on that. Um, you know, but like a regular employee's performance evaluation is not protected. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's just, it doesn't help that the way the FOIA is structured <laughs> It's like okay. personnel files are excluded except for, and then the exception is gigantic. So yeah. I could do a little bit more more research if you want. Mm. Well, uh, I'm just curious if that inhibits candid responses. That's the reason I ask. Yeah, I would say... Folks who have been in public service for a long time um, generally are aware of FOIA in everything they write down. They ought to be. Hmm. Okay. That may inspire candor. <laughs> it may inhibit candor, right. but they should at least right. be aware of it. 
Right. We can always defer this because I know we do want to get to the travel policy as well. So I think we've made we can continue the discussion about the format of the senior staff in a, in a, another meeting if you like. But I can hmm. come up with more suggestions. Okay. Well, I'm I'm just curious. What do others think about the approach that Holly described? You know, an email with a structure. You know, sort of topics uh, linked to competencies, open ended. Um, question at the end, because that seems to me to be efficient uh, with half a dozen people it could be effective. I think we'd probably get pretty good response rate. And um, before we spend more time thinking about other options, I'm just curious if um, what others think about that. I think that sounds reasonable. I might just add that you know, the types of questions that we come up with in trying to tie those to the competencies might mirror or it might be, um, you know, helpful to mirror them on the types of questions that um, the CEO would be asked to use in doing their own self-evaluation and opining on their performance, right? So um, it may be helpful to kind of tailor those questions in the same manner so that the senior staff is speaking directly to what we're also asking the CEO herself to speak directly to. Yeah. Okay. All Thank right. you so much for this discussion. Yeah, it was a good yeah. discussion. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a thoughtful one. It requires, uh, you know, thinking through how things work and what's practical as well as effective. Um, okay. Anything more on that topic? So, Aaron, what's the next steps on this topic, just so that we know for their next meeting? Um, so what I can, so what I can do for the next meeting is maybe propose what that, those questions related to the competencies look like. Um, we'll share the the draft around just so it has eyes on that again. And then okay. um, I would suggest we would be in position f to have everything written up by the March meeting so that we have a, a policy that the board can vote on in March. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, all your work on that as well. Um, next item on the agenda, uh, Michael, business, travel, and related expense policy proposed revisions. Thank you, Mike, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, so I think I previewed this a little bit uh, in last month's committee meeting. Um, we have spent, the authority had a little mini project uh, where we had spent some time going over our business travel and related expense policy, um, in part because sort of every policy should sort of be reviewed on a regular cadence to make sure it doesn't get stale. But also we've been sort of using the existing policy for a couple of years now. And so there were some things that we felt needed to be updated. Mm -hmm. um, that mini team uh, consisted of folks from legal, from the admin team, as well as finance. And we basically went over the policy and kind of highlighted and, and recommended some changes. So um, I think I shared the document with everybody. Uh, my apologies. I prefer to give sort of redline version of it, but because I moved things around, it was just a giant rainbow of color. So it wasn't that useful as a red line. So um, I'm going to go over sort of the goals of the effort as well as some of the examples of changes in the next slide. Um, but if there's any questions about any changes to highlight or any other things folks saw, um, please don't hesitate to raise them. Um, so it's sort of the purpose of the goal of the review. The original policy was written sort of in 2020 when we weren't sure what this program was going to be, the what a work arrangement was going to be. So um, some updates were related to that, such as that we're basically a remote workforce. I think at the time we weren't sure how often folks were going to go to the office. Um, and that's really not happening. We do have, um, you know, a home office in Hartford, 
Um, but 99% of the time, folks are working from home. So that does sort of have ripple effects to expenses related to commutes, sort of what's a standard commute. Um, other things we've sort of learned over the past couple of years, everyone has work issued phones. Um, so certain expenses related to like business calls or um, access to the internet, if you're on a trip and you need to sort of pay for internet, we no longer need to pay for that because our phones can use can do that. So it's already sort of incorporated in our costs. So no need for extra expenses. And similarly, I think the original policy had um, referenced sort of employees getting credit cards when they go on trips and sort of using them themselves. But we do have authority credit cards. It's sort of, they're all in the same people's hands and they don't sort of get handed to employees as they go on trips. So some changes were necessary for that. In addition, we wanted to make sure the document was user-friendly. Um, sort of the usefulness of any policy is somewhat based on the readability of that policy and for employees to sort of understand what they're looking at and know where to find um, answers to questions they may have. So that's why we sort of reorged the, the existing policy, adding a table of contents and sort of dividing it into sections. Um, the existing policy sort of just is provision after provision after provision. Um, so we felt that made it a little bit more easy to understand from an employee perspective. And then finally, as always, anytime we can add clarity um, to a policy is good. Um, removing any sort of unnecessary discretion or vague terms, you can't get rid of all of them, but sort of um, make it clear that as much as possible, things are black and white. And then include sort of factors to consider uh, in what's reasonable, because we had referred to reasonable a couple of times. So we sort of felt like maybe we should describe what we meant by reasonable. Um, is it just cost? Is it cost and safety? Um, other sort of needs uh, for expenses. So as I said, I, I'm not going to go through all the changes, but I did want to sort of highlight a few in each of the categories um, that are part of it, the policy. So for example, on lodging, the existing policy has sort of two rules, whether you get to pay for a hotel uh, or not. Um, one is if you cross state lines, um, then potentially your lodging would be paid for. And then a second rule, if it's in-state traveling greater than 75 miles, which sort of leads to a weird situation where if you live in, say, Suffield, Connecticut, and travel to Springfield, Massachusetts. You can stay overnight in a hotel, even though that's 10 miles away. But if you travel to New Haven from Suffield, you couldn't, even though that's you know five times as far. So we felt like we, one of our recommendations is to essentially have a universal rule that's based on distance. Crossing a state border isn't sort of an extra burden. You don't even notice when you cross the border most of the time. So let's just make it based on distance. And we felt 50 miles was a sort of acceptable distance for that. If you have a work event that's over multiple days and it's less than 50 miles from your home, the expectation is that you would go home uh, that night and return the next morning. There's an exception for sort of weather events or something else that would be within 50 miles, but um, it's our expectation that's gonna rarely occur. We also added um, an option of non-traditional uh, lodging. So this would be like Airbnb. If that's more convenient and obviously less expensive to the authority, we wanted to at least have that as an option. Um, available. For transportation, um, you know, one of the items we identified is use of an own car. And this is sort of tying back to what I mentioned about us being a remote workforce. The current policy sort of won't reimburse you for the distance traveled between your current your home and Hartford, um, even though you rarely go into Hartford because it's trying to anticipate what a commute would be. Um, what that leads to is folks who live really close to Hartford sort of get an advantage in that you know, I live five miles from the office. So if I were on a work trip and anything over five miles, suddenly I can get reimbursement. If I live 50 miles away from Hartford, I don't start getting reimbursed for my own car usage until my work trip is more than 50 miles, which just seemed unfair, a little bit inconsistent and not really based on any sort of um, meaningful relation to your actual job since we rarely commute to the office uh, for most folks. So similar to the lodging, we felt like a universal rule that applied to everyone was more fair. So essentially the first 20 miles of a work trip would not be reimbursable for use of your own car. Beyond that becomes reimbursable regardless of how far away you are from Hartford. Um, and then similar to the lodging, um, non-traditional options such as Uber, Lyft, things like that, we wanna consider at least as, as an option if that's the better choice than renting a car or using your own car. For meals and incidentals, um, Existing policy just has a flat rate based on the meal type. So it doesn't matter where you go. It reimburses the same for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Whether you're in New York City where things are fairly expensive or more remote location where you know breakfast is maybe cheaper, the current policy has the same reimbursement rate. Um, it also has references and sort of to the 
lack of clarity about tips being reimbursable if reasonable, um, but it doesn't really define what that means. And then it was unclear whether um, non-documented items would be reimbursable, sort of incidentals. Uh, there's a reference to items under $25, but then it sort of never carried through the rest of the policy. So um, we felt like it was, we were recommending a little more clarity on the meals and incidentals. For one, using the GSA rates based on location uh, for meals. So, you know, if you're a more expensive place uh, the trip is going, you potentially have more uh, money for those meals. We also added um, a table that defined when meals are reimbursable based on the timing of the travel, basically dragging and dropping the regulations from DAS, but now it's actually in our policy. So it's easy for employees to see. Um, and then specifically identifying that non-documented expenses and non-meal tips will will be covered under incidental costs, which once again, follows the GSA rates. I believe for most locations, it's about $10 a day, um, but I haven't checked every single location to see if that's across the board. From a process standpoint, um, existing policy is a little bit unclear about what expenses should be prepaid by the authority versus which expenses should be booked and paid for by the employee themselves, then reimbursed. Um, also, as I mentioned before, it sort of assumed that folks would be issued work issued charge cards for travel. Um, so our recommended changes are as much as possible, prepay and pre-approve any expenses um, that avoid sort of that awkwardness of, oh, no, this is an expense that we can't cover and you've already incurred that cost. So it sort of el eliminates that as a possibility as much as we can. Um, we specifically, we added some specificity to the review and approval process and then we remove the references to employee credit cards. And last but not least, excluded items. Um, existing policy sort of has the items that are not covered throughout various sections, and you sort of have to find where you're, you have to search through it. Um, as well as there's this sort of interesting section that we included about spouse travel. So if someone's on a business trip, an employee's on a business trip, and their spouse comes along, under very limited circumstances, the spouse's portion might be covered. I don't think we've ever done it. I doubt we have. And it sort of asks, more questions than it answered. So it just felt like inappropriate to include. So our recommended changes are to sort of put all excluded items in one section. So it's easy to find. If you wanna know if shoe shines are covered, you can go right to the end and see that. Um, also added the uh, section I mentioned before about we have, we have work issued phones. So expenses that can be covered under your work phone, there's no reason to pay separately for them. And then finally just remove the reimbursement for spousal travel. Um, Cause I said, it's sort of, was unusual and unexpected and we weren't using it anyway. Um, so that was, that's basically it. Um, sort of just the high level, what we, some of the changes we made, happy to take any questions or comment the board has. Yes, we want to add, we also explicitly acknowledge that if anyone is subject to collective bargaining, the collective bargaining agreement trumps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments for Michael? Exhilarating document, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ellen, did you have a question? No. Okay. Just laughing at your joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, anyone have any old business to raise? Hearing nothing. Anyone have any new business to raise? Okay, hearing nothing, we move to adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. It is 9.54. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>